So, everybody awake again, so we can continue. Thank you so much. Uh, this talk, uh, I prepared uh, some of the things uh, of the aneurysm SAH uh, from our own experience, about multimodal neuro monitoring, the ShoUT experience. Um, this talk is a little bit more personal uh, because it includes more of my own work uh, than the t talk previously. It is also on the other side less the f solid evidence as citations of guidelines and rec solid recommendations as there aren't any. I feel I start with the most important tip. Um, I show you what does work in my opinion, this is nimodipine. After subarachnoid hemorrhage, I show you uh, the difference between the different brands of probes. These are returning questions uh, uh, from many of these classes, like you are. I uh, show you some of the evidence for brain tissue oxygenation monitoring after subarachnoid hemorrhage. How to influence a low reading. We did not touch this issue uh, very uh, much so far. And show you some promising, in my opinion, promising data about what may work in slumber drains in subarachnoid hemorrhage from our uh, finished early drain study, premature for publication, but still uh, some uh, maybe interesting slides. This is the most <laughs> important tip ever if you use this kind of multimodal neuromonitoring. monitoring. This is from the Berlin Star Wars experience when this new uh, trilogy of Star Wars films came out two years ago. In December, I think the next one also starts here in Russia. Um, well, it was uh, Zoologischer Garten, the middle of the uh, 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 Berlin, uh, heart of old Western Berlin, where this TIE fighter landed. Um, and the most important tip for all uh, using this kind of monitoring stuff I showed to you is use some dedicated software to record the values to get some proper understanding what happened and what happens with your patient. What were the readings, not only this 15 seconds of a monitor, but were the readings two hours ago, <coughs> one day ago, just to learn from your own data. For this, you need to have some dedicated software sitting at the bedside of the computer just to record this online. The advantage of learning this way is tremendous. You see what you are doing, and you can recognize way more early what the complications of a particular patient may be. So this is also a research tool, but also for clinical use, I would re recommend recording software. There's freeware on the internet, there's some rather high priced, uh, priced things, but you'll find something, as uh, you did here in Bodenko Institute as well. Okay, so nimodipine. Evidence is old. It's 89 from John Picard, uh, the head of neurosurgery at Cambridge University in the UK. This is one facility doing a lot of neurointensive care research. This is the reason why this name comes up very often. They had the British Nematopi trial. It was a randomized multicenter trial with four sites, including patients uh, getting either nimodipine, six times uh, 60 milligram per day for 21 days versus placebo. And this is the current formulation we are using even now in 2017. They included uh, mostly good grade patients, so 278 versus 276 is a huge study, so it's over 500 patients. Mostly Hunt has grade 1 and 2 or 3, less severely affected patients. Uh, well, this is the usual uh, distribution of patients, predominantly female, uh, middle age of 46, nowadays a little bit older, because we tend to treat patients which are older as well, this is over time changes. So it's the history lesson, this kind of study reading. Um, the timing to operation from initial subarachnoid hemorrhage was 10 days to 11 days, so it's not current modern times, where we focus on early, surgery, uh, uh, early uh, surgery or early coiling. It was surgery only where this trial was uh, at this time where the trial took place. You need to keep that in mind to acknowledge the outcome results. But then, um, it was a, in my opinion, modernly crafted study which uh, holds up to current standards. Looking at the outcome, the effect of nimodipine on the incidence of shrivel infarction and outcome uh, measured by the Glasgow outcome scale, uh, well, patients taking nimodipine, cerebral infarct are 22% versus 33%. 
so as a significant reduction, and poor outcome is a dichotomized scale, uh, also significant difference in favor of nimodipine. Difficult to understand, a little bit less <coughs> repletes, it's not significant, but on the verge of significance, it may be attributed with a little bit lower blood pressure in the nimodipine group, but the paper does not give that much details upon. When reading this paper, I focused two questions. One sentence was, in Glasgow, the prevalence of reported alcohol abuse was lowest. Ever been to Glasgow? I don't believe that. See the people on the streets, you know what I mean. Next thing is, the protocol allowed for adjustment of dose if hypertension acute, but this was not found to be necessary. And this is quite contrary to my uh, experience with nimodipine. If you use this drug, this happens frequently. As seen here on the slide, taken with multimodal neuromonitoring, so it's a one day of uh, intensive care treatment from our own ICU, from the uh, early drain trial, you see uh, nimotipine every six hours, and always afterwards see a little bit drop on the arterial blood pressure. It's not notable in some instances, but it's there almost every time, and sometimes quite uh, large. There's almost no affection on the cardiac output, the ICP, not affected, brain tissue oxygenation, patient initially and then stayed over a long time, deteriorated a little bit later on, difficult to notice. However, these little blood pressure drops are a frequent question in clinical use of nimonitipine orally with tablets. The question is, what should we do with them? We saw in some, thing, in some occasions, uh, we gave the full dose, was predominantly good grade patients, in some patients we half the dose, so six times 60, six times 30 milligram. In some patients, we stopped the dose almost uh, entirely. It was predominant in the high grade patients with Hunter's grade four and five. This is a typo. This was a retrospective analysis, but then there's still something inside your data. So you may want to look at your data as well for these kind of questions. If you look at it, Univariate analysis for outcome, meaning modified ranking scale above two is unfavorable outcome. Age is a known predictor. Hunt has grade, higher grade leads to worse outcome. This is more or less obvious. Hunt has the same is for Fisher grade. Angiographic versus plasma is a problem. And nimodipine, nimodipine dosage. The odds ratio is negative, meaning lower dosage leading frequently to worse outcome. Norepinephrine dosage here also associated uh, with worse outcome significantly. So what to do? Should we increase the norepinephrine and keep the nimodipine or skip the nimodipine and increase, uh, uh, keep the same norepinephrine level? And it turns out in multivariate analysis, age stays significant, Hunt has great as well, and the nimodipine dosage where norepinephrine dosage cancels out, meaning just in case you have a patient with blood pressure drops, think of a reduction only with very high doses of noradrenaline, if you require that. Up to 0 0.5 mics, we use it to keep the doses of nimodipine and just increase temporarily uh, the noradrenaline. The data is sparse when we approach one mic uh, milligram per kilogram uh, per minute of noradrenaline. There are only few patients with almost universally worse outcome. It's very difficult to make predictions in these kind of uh, situation. But for the other patients, just stick with the nimodipine. It's truly outcome relevant even in 2016. The dose is important over the first 14 days. This was how we analyzed that because this was a period with the best uh, electronic capture of data, so this was uh, taken from our patient data management system. It's not from paper records, which may be misleading, may be lost, may be something else. This is just electronic data analyzed uh, with a little bit more elaborate statistic, and it worked. If in doubt, increase no adrenaline, keep the nimonipine dose, and um, I omitted the slides just for brevity of, uh, uh, there's plenty of things to talk as we learned in the previous discussion. There's no study out showing that IV, IV nimodipine is an advantage over the oral formulation. It's just 10 times more expensive. 
if you use it IV. It's not better in keeping the patients better protected. It should be from a physiologic understanding because uh, the resorption uh, element is just uh, skipped. But then it seems to be that the serum doses, the metabolism in the liver, is quite different between different patients. And this may be the clue to measure the level of nimodipine in the bloodstream to get a truly protective rate. Uh, but this is not common. Also in our institute, we are not able to measure this online. But it may be one idea to overcome these kind of problems. And then the IV nimodipine may be advantaged. So far, the largest study, 180 patients, it is not. So this is about nimodipine. What about monitoring after subarachnoid hemorrhage? All patients, I think this is clinical standard all over the world, get a clinical exam. And in Berlin, we are using in poor grade patients only, daily TCD. Poor grade means Hunt tests three, four, and five uh, patients with delirium, patients with intercurrent hemorrhage, the good grade patients with just headache are usually discharged after a few days to a step-down unit or even to the regular ward just to keep them ambulating, just to keep them walking. They are not kept uh, just isolated uh, with bed rest for 14 days. And this is the reason why TCD is not available on the normal ward on a frequent daily basis. But the poor grade patients do have TCD daily, on a daily basis to get some idea of the macrovasculature. They have CT angiography and CT perfusion uh, on a frequent basis to give some spatial resolution over the whole brain. And if there's an area sticking out, they get a brain tissue oxygenation group for a good temporal resolution because you cannot do a CT scan every three hours. It's too much radiation dose. But every three to four days sounds reasonable for me. So the question is where to place the probe. This is one study from Alejandro Rabinstein from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. It was reassuring that they have infarctions after subarachnoid hemorrhage too, that everybody has this all over the world, and not the Americans are not just having no infarctions. What to learn from this study is there's no clearly association between the territory of the aneurysm and the stroke. In this case, it happens to be the same, but in other cases, multiple deep, uh, tiny infarctions is difficult to predict from the aneurysm location. So there's a preponderance, uh, the same side of the aneurysm. If it's left MCA, it's more left-sided infarctions. If it's the right side, usually it's more right side. But if it gets to the posterior fossa, it's difficult to predict. It's not only brainstem, but also supratentorial. So and the reason why to, where to place a probe is difficult to decide just from the aneurysm location. It's good for a first shot, but it's not all you can learn. Looking at a CT scan plainly, like this one, doesn't tell you that much. Sometimes CT scans uh, are just looking in the past and not in the immediate past. But if you do a CT perfusion scan and have this seen once in your patients, you are committed to a believer. This is a patient having a CT perfusion, meaning getting contrast media in the same imaging at the same level over, let's say, 40 seconds. In this patient, you saw a mean transit time, which is more bluish, about 10 seconds in the right anterior territory. You see the CBF is lower, the blue is on the other side of the scale here, in the same territory, and the zero, zero blood volume is about the same, a little bit less. So this territory may get infarctions, but it may be artifact from the probe city, uh, sitting here. But this one is definitely no artifact. This is vasospasm from A1 vasospasm on the right side in a patient with no cross flow at the communicating artery. It was an AK aneurysm where the uh, and just the communicating, anterior communicating artery was just uh, taken out of the clipping itself, so it was an isolated circulation on the right side. And if you've seen this once, this is no established infarction, this is treatable. You can do something about that. And you need to have some advanced monitoring to recognize it on the bedside, because you cannot always rush to the CD scan if the patient has some problem. Usually these kind of patients are drowsy or even intubated. They are difficult to monitor clinically alone. Yes, you need some probe, in this case a Lycox probe, but we did some comparison studies as well. We had 11 patients uh, with both types of probes, just side by side in the same parenchyma. Predominantly SAH, but a few traumatic brain injury patients were inside that. Physiology should work in both diseases the same. 
we tried uh, interventions with mean arterial blood pressure and FIO2 rise, and then comparing the trends. Results were lycosprobe started a little bit lower, rheumatic a little bit higher, but the tendency over time was quite the same with the gray area giving the confidence in the 95% confidence interval being rather large and overlapping. But then the difference between these two probes was significant. The direction was the same. The same when the mean arterial blood pressure rose, same direction in the probe sitting side by side. If we pool all values and get the mean of both plotted against the difference, you see that the Lycos probe tend to have difference higher here, tend to, tend to have a little bit higher reading in the low side. This is millimeter mercury and the rheumatic probe tend to have a little bit higher reading on the high side. But the 20, which issued as the order whether to treat or not, is the same for both probes. So you can use them interchangeably from this kind of plot. And the same is done from the trend data. This is a rather fancy statistics which I did myself, but I still did not comprehend everything the way it should be probably. Um, it's just taking one snapshot at one uh, hour and taking the same snapshot of both probes one hour later and plotting this on the four quadrant plot or this polar plot. It's rather nicely on the same line of identity which is the diagonal here and the 180 to 0 degree line here. Main thing out of these kind of uh, analysis is the trend of both probes do correlate well. The difference of absolute values are mostly brain tissue heterogeneity so that one thing of the part of the brain is not the same one centimeter away. This is a major limit of these focal measurements. But when you can get some trend with either probe and can get it well. What can you do with this kind of oxygen monitoring? It's subroid hemorrhage patients from Innsbruck, Austria. Uh, Raymond Helbuck did that, friend of mine. He had the mean arterial blood pressure. Uh, patients were about to wean from the mandicular ventilation, had a T-piece trial here, the 60 minutes. Blood pressure in both groups, them failing uh, the weaning trial and them uh, succeeding the weaning trial, about the same, no big difference. The same for CPP. ICP went a little bit more up in the patients failing, but no clear difference between both groups. The difference was seen in the brain tissue alienation. From the starting level, patients who succeeded in weaning improved a little bit, was fine to extubate them, and these were the patients who need to be required reintubation or putting back to the ventilator who failed the extubation trial and needed an early restart of sedation. So the difference only seen in oxygenation, not in the classic monitoring methods. Looking at another problem, patients routinely after subarachnoid hemorrhage is the most frequent group to develop fever. More than 50% will develop fever during their clinical course. If you look at the fever burden, 82 is usually in most uh, instances, it says in most institutes, uh, the threshold where to treat them. So it was 83 here. 38.2 uh, uh, here, and they decreased the fever with uh, intravenous uh, diclofenac, um, which use, uh, was quite useful. The patients, well, behaved well and controlled for the ICP, the grayish box. There was a difference in CPP, though, went down considerably, and also the oxygen monitoring went down a few millimeter mercury. And it tended out that these patients with a higher CPP drop had the more severe oxygen drop. It was not particularly upfront. Patients who uh, were below the margin of 20 millimeter mercury had way more frequently modified ranking score five and six, meaning dependent, severely dependent, bedridden, or dead, versus the patients who did not develop this uh, drop of uh, brain tissue oxygenation pressure. This is only seen in oxygenation, not with the other monitoring methodologies. It was a significant difference. So you may want to want uh, to get a little bit more knowledge of your subarachnoid hemorrhage patient uh, with oxygen monitoring than without it. This is one of the classic studies by Elke Münch um, from then Mannheim University in Germany. They did the classic uh, Triple H trial with a subarachnoid hemorrhage patient. They had 
extensive monitoring with regional cerebral blood flow with the hematex probe and oxygen monitoring with the Lycox probe, implanted, uh, in, uh, did a test with hypertension, increased blood pressure, saw an increase in blood flow, saw an increase in oxygen, the same direction. If they did only volume expansion, this 2H group here, uh, on day one, there was almost nothing on cerebral blood flow, but a decline even on brain tissue oxygenation, meaning the uh, differential, uh, uh, difference between the probe and, uh, it was t more difficult for the oxygen in more conduced and more edematous tissue uh, to be delivered. If you combine both uh, hypertension and hypovolemia, getting a little bit additional effect in the earlier days, like here, but no net gain uh, on the cerebral uh, brain tissue oxygenation. And this was one of the studies uh, just uh, getting rid of the original concept of hemodilution, hemo uh, hypertension, and hypovolemia because it does not work over time because the effects were only seen for hypertension. So this was one of the classic explanations seen by neuromonitoring, extensive neuromonitoring, best on day one, less frequently on day three and day seven after submarine hemorrhage. The main conclusions uh, of the study was that not all components of triple H therapy were equally effective. And hypovolemia especially does not simply seem to improve cerebral perfusion and worsen oxygenation. There's a lot of criticism attached to the study. The main thing is the hematics is a nice and promising technology but has some validity problems. There was no vasospasm in the blood flow measurements on day seven, but in six out of 10 patients in an angiography. So the question is where the probes were truly placed. It's not written in the paper. And if you have done uh, neurointensive care, as all of you did, having a blood pressure of 140 millimeter mercury, mean arterial blood pressure over time, is just demanding for most patients. Not all will succeed them. Also the blood volume goals were very ambitious. There was no documented cardiac output. The duration of intervention is not stated. So the study has problems, as each study has. You need to recognize these kind of uh, problems to get a proper interpretation. Looking at endovascular therapy, it may guide uh, your uh, dealing with endovascular therapy after uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage in patients with vasospasm as well. This is a small study from uh, also Germany, Stuttgart, uh, in the southern part of Germany. They had eight patients uh, with aneurysma somewhat hemorrhage in brain tissue nation monitoring with a routine screen with vasospasm for TCD, perfusion CT, and CTA. And the patients with severe vasospasm, like this one here on the ICA, had an endovascular therapy with interarterial vera per mil. Worked nicely for radiologic uh, imaging. This is the monitoring data. If it's mild to moderate vasospasm, 35 to 40. If it's severe vasospasm, 27 to 38 in millimeter mercury, so there's quite an improvement. CPP levels were kept about the same, so it was not more perfusion, it was uh, pressure, it was just the same, but with widened vessels. ICP rose a little bit in the latter one because the vessels dilate, but still no problem. So you won't get too much from ICP reading in subroid hemorrhage to current understanding. Systemic oxygenation stays the same. FIR2 as well. The oxygen improvement in the focal method is quite interesting, so it was nice. One criticism for this kind of study, these are not values indicating compromise of pro tissue oxygenation. The total your threshold of 20 million mercury, this was way above, so there's a question whether this rather good vasculature does just need this kind of therapy. So we need still fiddling about the indication when to do this and which with which, with which method. I have some own data on this to show you the thing uh, with this brain tissue oxygenation and uh, CBF monitoring in endovascular therapy. This is a patient who got interatrial nimodipine, which is more common in more institutions than verapamil, but the evidence is equally weak. You see start level, cerebral blood flow, here stable more or less, these fluctuations is just hematics readings, stable readings, recalibration period, and then we started the nimodipine. It went up huge. CPF increased over time, 
we finished nimorepine into a theory of a catheter just placed in the uh, C4 of the carotid, and it went back after a uh, stop of infusion just to the normal values. In this case, oxygen, the bluish ones, even drop over this infusion. I don't really know why. Maybe some steel effect that the probe was not in the correct vascular territory. Sometimes it's difficult to decide, I have to admit. You see the ICP values here in uh, purple increase a little bit because the vessels dilate, need more space. So this is the reason for the ICP to increase. Systemic circulation with blood pressure and cardiac output stays about the same. So there's no change. You need to have some focal monitoring method to see what you're doing with this kind of rather invasive therapy for endovascular vasospasm, whether the patient truly benefits from that. How could you influence the reading of a low brain tissue oxygenation? Volume status carry output brain tissue oxygenation was investigated by Pietro Kurtz, who's from Columbia, New York. Uh, they just gave a volume challenge, uh, 75 volume challenge in 10 patients with ASB and disturbed autoregulation. You saw cardiac index change on most of the volume challenges and the corresponding absolute change in brain tissue oxygenation and the relative change as well. So it looks like volume sometimes even may help if the patient is volume depleted. It's very difficult to establish whether a patient is euvolemic or hypovolemic or hypervolemic. Central venous pressure used to work 20 years ago, but it did never work really and it doesn't today. So it's difficult to decide on. Um, well, you see a correlation between volume, so it may want to give the patient a volume change, especially if the cardiac index is low. If the cardiac index is high, Maybe a different situation. If you look at transfusion, another idea just to boost hemoglobin levels. They started a, a transfusion trigger of hemoglobin at eight. Again, Pietro Kurtz, another study from the same group. Unless there was evidence for ischemia, whatever that meant, it was not clearly stated in the paper. They had 15 <laughs> patients with aneurysm as up and transfused transfuse the patients. You saw an effect on the readings of brain tissue oxygenation after two to four hours. There was a significant increase in brain tissue oxygenation of a borderline brain tissue oxygenation before. And then it went down after 12 hours again. If you look at microdialysis lactate pyruvate ratio, high above 30, but not above 40, which is the current threshold for severe ischemia, well, no big changes. If you look at the numeric analysis in the multivariate analysis, the change of homoglobin, for brain tissue oxygenation is significant uh, correlation. Also the cerebral perfusion pressure and tidal uh, lactate pyruvate ratio. And tidal CO2 does not do anything and baseline SO2 does not either. Well, you see, if a patient is compromised in macrodialysis, it may be an idea to get the patient a transfusion, but solely based on oxygen reading may work or may not. It's difficult to predict the reason for multimodal monitoring. If you don't have either of these values, if you don't have e even oxygen monitoring, it's difficult to decide whether to transfuse or not. If you're transfusing all patients, we know that from other studies, we are probably inducing harm. So there's no way to apply just uh, to packs of red blood cells to every patient with less than 10 millimeter uh, than less than 10 in hemoglobin level. Looking at oxygen, what does that do? The data is sparse. This is, again, the New York group in the JNNP, but this time with only systemic oxygen monitoring. They invested the SHOP database, Subright Hemorrhage Outcome Project SHOP. Uh, the collaboration of several hundred, now about 16, 1,700 patients over 20 years of time for the use of oxygen. Just it was applied uh, at the bedside. It was no prospective study, but it was a retrospective analysis. They looked at the differences between patients getting to relate cerebral ischemia or not, or getting this. According to the Fisher scale, patients with delayed cerebral ischemia in each Fisher grade had a little bit higher reading on the amount of oxygen in the blood pressure. So they aimed for more than 100 millimeter mercury, and patients with higher re oxygen in the blood had more frequent ischemia over all Fisher grades. The same here with the modified ranking scale. There was a difference in the modified ranking scales. Patients with higher oxygen levels had less often a favorite outcome 
in patients uh, with lower oxygen levels. Again, stratified to fissure grades. The same looked at from another perspective. Patients with below 100 millimeter mercury oxygen on average, 100, 230, 260, and even higher levels. And the incidence of delayed cerebral ischemia went up when more than 190. And incidence of modified ranking to 46 got a higher proportion, even if you're crossing the 100 millimeter mercury margin. Also a significant relationship, so you may not want to have this high boost of oxygen in all patients, just to get a good reading of the brain tissue resonation probe. Again, this was not introduced, uh, brain tissue resonation in this study, but high oxygen is not always a good thing. Again, multivariate anal analyzed. Age is a significant predictor for worse outcome. Hunt has great aneurysm size in this study. Rebleeding, the current hemorrhage is a bad thing. And the exposure to hypoxia, meaning levels for more than 150 millimeter mercury, is also in this study a negative predictor for outcome. So you may want to consider whether increasing the knob on the oxygen on the ventilator to uh, 60 or 100 percent is a good idea over time. It's good for a short reaction test, but not for long-term treatment. The same goes up from another study from Italy, published last year uh, in JAMA. This is about generalized EU patients. And what they did randomize, it's a randomized controlled trial. Uh, they did a conservative treatment of 70 to 100 millimeter mercury, and then oxygen was cut down versus 100, usually standard conventional treatment at the ICU before, the most standard for neuro patients in the ICU all over the world. What they saw, the study was closed prematurely uh, because uh, not of effect size or some finding, but because the ICU was destroyed by an earthquake. It's just one reason to close a study prematurely, which is solid. Um, then they analyzed their data and saw a difference in the outcome for the conservative oxygen therapy, aiming for a PaO2 level of 70 to 100, they had better survival, probability, higher probability of survival than the patients with the conventional oxygen therapy, as most of us probably do. And again, the primary outcome, significant difference, and also secondary outcomes were in favor of more, the more conservative setting for oxygen like shock, like liver failure, or bacteremia. So always better with a more conservative approach. It's difficult to make uh, any final conclusions out of this data. The study is repeated in the European community. It's start underway. But uh, we need to have a look at this multi-center data. It was just a single center experience. But giving just oxygen to correct the low brain tissue oxygenation reading may be an idea, but maybe not a good idea. <laughs> Unfortunately, neuro patients were too infrequent in this collective to be analyzed separately. We cannot draw any final conclusions out of that. Just an idea that treating a number, like this ICP reading with the hyperventilation, just treating a number may not every time be a good idea. Coming to outcome after brain tissue urination reading and uh, subcoronate hemorrhage, this is uh, one American study, I think it's from Chicago. They analyzed the time of compromised brain tissue urination in survivors and non-survivors in their own ICU. This was not a before and after, but the same collective. You saw survivors with less compromise between two, below 25, and the time of hypoxia episodes below 15 were even less frequently in survivors, but they had some episodes. So not every low reading translates to a worse outcome. You need just to try to take care of that. In case the patients had a prolonged episode of hypoxia, they were almost likely to not survive this. It's minutes per episode, uh, the unit on this uh, scale. This is one idea. Another idea comes from Leipzig, Germany. Matthias Jäger who was, uh, well, quitted neurosurgery shortly after this paper and went to Australia just to five-fold higher income. And he does a little bit more spinal surgery now. Not this fancy stuff on the neurointensive care unit, but now as a solid income for his kids. Um, investigated uh, the oxygen reactivity index, looking at the correlation between oxygen, cerebral perfusion pressure over time. If they go in parallel, it's a defective autoregulation. If they go anti-parallel, so this one is going down and the other one is pretty steady, 
the oxygen level. As it should be in a healthy being, there's no good correlation. The oxygen reactivity is around zero. In this case, it's a highly uh, positive correlation. It's a disturbed autoregulation. And this kind of oxygen reactivity index turns out to be a good predictor over time between patients deteriorating with worse outcome, high, and the patients with a lower oxygen reactivity index are the patients with good outcome, significant way before the vasospasm starts on day three, up to day 10 in this study. There was only a minor difference on the absolute values of oxygen level, and it was even flipped around, uh, as would be expected. CPP, no difference. ICP, no difference. Analyzed in multivariate analysis, you see this oxygen reactivity index translates to a significant predictor for uh, Glasgow outcome scale. The oxygen level tend to be, while the classic parameters, CPP, ICP, start of monitoring time, uh, time of volume monitoring, does not help you that much. But oxygen reactivity index seems to be a, have a relationship with Glasgow outcome scales. This one is survivors. This one are the patients who died. This shows the problem of this kind of analysis with retrospective cohort studies. These people obviously use brain tissue oxygenation for treatment of patients. The oxygen reactivity index was not used for treatment, but was calculated afterwards retrospectively. So this parameter is just diluted and compromised, and this one is uncompromised. This is a problem when analyzing data retrospectively, you using all this for clinical investigations and clinical decision making. This makes it particularly difficult to get a good idea what is working and what is not from retrospective. You need to have a prospective study, which is unfortunately not available for oxygen monitoring uh, and uh, suborbital hemorrhage, like the boost trauma, uh, study was for the traumatic brain injury patients. This is about monitoring, but still we want to have prevention. And I want to share some of the data in the final slides about cerebral spinal fluid diversion. This is cerebral spinal fluid from a patient with subordinate hemorrhage taken simultaneously from an EVD and a lumbar drain. As is presented here, you may guess which is which. Well, the EVD is this one, and the lumbar drain is this one, taken at the same time in the same patient. May I ask the audience whether anybody's using lumbar drains in subroid hemorrhage? And who is not? Well, most people are not using it currently. So maybe I can show you some convincing to rethink this uh, issue. This was based on one study by Paul Clymer, Salt Lake City. They happened to have one group of surgeons uh, who always were keen of using a lumbar drain to drain the blood from the lumbar root. And the other uh, group of surgeons was thinking it was devil's work. Uh, they didn't use lumbar drains at all. And they have an alternating schedule where one of each group was on call. And this made a pseudo-randomization. They looked at their patients after 10 years of time. They saw a big difference in outcome. Glasgow outcome score of five, meaning no relevant deficit. 71% in this group, in lumbar drain group, was only 45% in the patients with conventional treatment. They're afraid about the same. This striking difference led in 2004 some centers to the use uh, of lumbar drains and subroid hemorrhage. But still, there was no convincing evidence. The published retrospective works is usually in favor of some intervention, so otherwise it wouldn't be published. But the patient distribution was not completely fairly balanced between treatment groups. It was a retrospective design. There was no doubt uh, data on the amount of drainage and the long-term outcome. It took three months, six months or even longer is not documented. Prospective data, there's one study out in 2012 published uh, by a UK group. They used predominantly good-grade patients uh, in contrast to the more high-grade patients. This prospective data was not supported but with only 200 patients was underpowered for the effect size in good grade patients because infarctions do happen less often in good grade patients than in severe high grade patients. Well, we asked ourselves whether this lumbar drain would be a useful thing. We did a multi-center trial uh, on lumbar drainages and asked the question whether this early lumbar CSF drainage improves the clinical outcome after annual lumbar drainage and decreases the incidence of vasospasm. It was a study code of published up front 2011 when we started this study just to make everything fixed and that nobody 
could uh, interpret things differently later on. Patient of suffered hemorrhage, consented for study inclusion and aneurysm treatment, had the treatment, had a randomization, one group had a lumbar drain inserted, uh, with, uh, which was drained with five milliliters per hour for the first seven to 10 days. The control group had no such intervention, had no lumbar drain, was just dry, required as uh, indicated by EVD by the surgeon. We had a CT scan on day seven to 10 with an optional angiography or CTA or MRA as the corresponding center was uh, usual standard of care. Had a CT scan for discharge to see whether the infarction occurred and a modified ranking score by telephone interview or personal communication with the patient at a control angiography at six months. This was the algorithm. This is what we got. Lumbar drainage group, no lumbar drainage group, 145 patients in each group. Age, a little bit older than uh, previous, the British Nymatop trial, 54. Predominantly female uh, uh, patients, 68%. And this time we had good grade patients, also at high grade patients. Even Hunter's grade five, considerable number of them. Few missing data, only one patient got lost over time. This is, uh, was quite difficult to achieve everybody's outcome. And to get it, the fissure grades, predominantly all fissure grades uh, seen in the study. We did not have any restrictions when to uh, include a patient in the study. Thick SAH, fissure grade three, was split between interventional hemorrhage and not, without and with. Also was the patient with intercranial hemorrhage and interventricular hemorrhage. So this gave this fissure grades. Number of aneurysms, well, the same as all over the world, half and half about clipping and coiling. On the angiographic basis spasm, as it was randomized, there was virtually no difference. So the vessels in there was rated by the uh, radiologist as well as best in about 57%, with some uh, performing only a DSA uh, MR angiography, predominantly was CT, it was uh, DSA. As a clinical suspicion, when the clinician wanted to have it, or as a routine on day seven to 10. Difference, not significant, but in favor of lumbar drains was seen for new infarctions. This were pretty the sick patients, 30%. So lumbar drains a short favor as in the as randomized data as they entered the trial. And this is the outcome data. I omitted the P value because I'm still analyzing a few outliers, a few problems, patients, and see what happens. This is as randomized. Less mortality in conditional treatment, less patients with modified ranking score five being bedridden and completely nursing dependent with the lumbar drainage. More frequently good outcome modified ranking one, zero, one or two, as was defined in the protocol. So in favor of the lumbar drain. I showed you the as randomized data. But why made there their difference as randomized versus as treated? We had some reasons for not being treated accordingly to a protocol, it was a hardware failure. It was impossible to insert a lumbar drain the patient with a morbus pectere, for instance. Uh, sometimes it did not simply, it simply did not work out, or the patient pulled it on day one, was not replaced. Some patients were issued safety concerns um, in one center. The other centers did not have, it was 20 centers, uh, the study. Sometimes there was a requirement of full anticoagulation, making it impossible after coiling to place the patient, uh, get the patient placed with the lumbar drain. Some errors happened in assignment, so there was some wrong decisions from the ICU team. And three patients had a request of the consulting neurologist for a treatment for lumbar drain. I don't know why these guys uh, just took part in a randomized controlled trial if they didn't understand the principle, but then it was the way it was. If you look at the as treated data, there's a striking difference with less infarctions uh, in the lumbar drainage group. And also there's a significant result uh, for the favorable lumbar outcome with the modified ranking scale at six months. So this may be an idea. Looking at subgroups, male and female, well, on the side of lump, favors lumbar drain, the females are just the larger group. There's a reason for the little bit shorter confidence intervals. Anterior circulation and posterior circulation, but the posterior circulation is a very few patients, so it's not a good idea to base any firm conclusions on that. Clipping versus coiling equally for both uh, treatment modalities. Looking at the age groups, 
effect is more pronounced in younger patients, being more on the side of favors lumbar drain, and being more on the high end test score four and five patients. So it's more effect on this side. Also, the higher fissure grade patients have an idea to get better outcome with a lumbar drain than with an EVD. Well, to summarize, findings of ICU treatment after aneurysmal subcutaneous hemorrhage. Nimodipine still in use, it's class one evidence. I think you should use it. The monitoring, well, in poor grade patients, it may facilitate early recognition of unfortunate effects and unfortunate clinical course, maybe give you a chance to intervene. You need to have some kind of software to record this properly at the bedside to get the correct conclusions. You should probably combine different methods, which is the meaning of the wording, multimodal monitoring, brain tissue recognition, with ICP, with Doppler, with CT perfusion, or sometimes use a second probe if in doubt that you're at the correct vascular territory. This may change over time. So you may want to have a CT perfusion and repeat it over time to see whether everything is still the same, uh, the vasus basin distribution and the uh, malperfusion is still the same distribution. And lumbar drains at least seem promising in younger, more severely affected patients, to our opinion. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have brain tissue inclination, so far the number needed to treat is unknown. You need further research. You need to have some collaboration with the industry and some sponsorship with industry. Clinicians are not likely to do this on their own and just uh, for out of nothing. We need to have support from grants. We need to have support from the industry with equipment, and we need to play with that. And this is the reason why I'm teaming up with industry. They are partners, not uh, competitors. Thank you very much for your attention.